Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as we hear from Han Mace, who works at Bug Crowd, she's one of our fantastic Temporal users. Uh, my name is Tasha Alfano. I work at Temporal as one of our product managers, um, and I'm super excited to hear Han's story today. Um, and if you want to stay more connected with us um, or, or ask our team questions about what what you might have seen today or heard, um, you can check out our community Slack. Um, and we also have a community page, temporal.io slash community. Um, we'd love to talk to you there and hear about all the great things that you're working on. Um, and maybe you can be one of our uh, presenters in the future. Uh, and then the last thing that I'll mention is uh, Replay, what you see on the screen. Replay is coming up so soon. Um, we're just a few short weeks away from Replay, um, and we would love to see you there. I'll be there. I know Han will be there, um, and we would love to meet you in person and hear about all the ways that you're using Temporal. Um, there are some, going to be some really fantastic sessions. Um, there's a promo code here if you haven't registered already, and we hope to see you there. So. The reason we're all here today is, is Han Mace. Um, Han is a, an artist um, turned software engineer who is who's is using her creative capabilities um, to use Temporal for workflows at Bug Crowd. Um, and I'm so excited to hear her tell us all about her experience. Um, and she has a really great chat prepared for us today. Um, so I will go ahead and hand it over to you, Han. Just a reminder, put your questions down in the uh, Q&A section and um, take it away, Han. Well, thank you, Tasha. Um, hey, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today. So yeah, I'm Han Mace, and I just wanted to talk about how my small team of three engineers were able to implement temporal workflows, and we actually brought a legacy process into a new age while tripling our development productivity. And so before I begin, I just want to say thank you so much to the team at Temporal for putting this together. Um, this was a really fun opportunity. And so before we begin and get too deep into the weeds, let's just talk about what BugCrowd is. Um, BugCrowd is a crowdsourced cybersecurity platform, and we have two main groups of customers, organizations and hackers. So we offer a service that's a bridge between the organizations and hackers. We host bug bounties and penetration tests while also orchestrating the collaboration between organizations seeking security insights and skilled hackers who are eager to contribute. We do have a few different models on our platform. Some engagements are completely open to the public and any hacker can contribute. And others are a little bit more exclusive and require um, very specialized and skilled hackers. And it's that second um, section, that second model that we're really focusing on within these workflows. So before we go any further, I'll just kind of tell you a little bit about the team behind this initiative. Our team is pretty small. We had three backend engineers while building this. And we all brought our own diverse backgrounds of Ruby, Java, and Python. Uh, we had previously done a lot of development within our Rails monolith app, and we worked on features and API development. So working in Kotlin was brand new for two of us, but we really enjoyed the concise syntax, static typing, and building something from the ground up. So despite our modest size and inexperience, we were able to successfully orchestrate the deployment of numerous intricate workflows and activities. And when others at our company saw how well Temporal was working for us and how much time it ultimately saved, we managed to bring other teams on board and we got them caught up with all of the possibilities. And I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about myself as well. Um, I do come from the art world and I was always interested in math and science along with art. So after some self-reflection, I knew that I wanted to work in an industry that was a, that had opportunity for stability and growth. So I wasn't sure if software engineering would be a good fit for me at first, but after I kind of practiced and got to know it a little bit better, I realized that it was definitely just another creative outlet. And during my time at Bug Crowd, I've been given many opportunities to challenge myself through some pretty diverse projects. 
And before we can understand how we used temporal, it's good to see the way that things were. And this is a diagram of the previous process that we had. When we wanted to find the right hackers for an engagement, we had this specific pro process that relied on extensive communication, spreadsheet analysis, and leveraging tacit knowledge. Um, and that knowledge was built up after over 10 plus years of being an industry leader. So we had a lot of specific data that we used to find the right hackers for, a, for an organization and an engagement. A customer would meet with one of our operations specialists, and this would lead to a comprehensive discussion about potential requirements. And then the ops specialist would distill this information and formalize it into a rubric of sorts. And they used that as a reference to filter through our thousands of hackers within our platform. The goal of this whole process was to curate a cohort of hackers that were the best match for this specific criteria. And this methodology was effective during our initial growth phase, but it was very intensive and um, it involved a lot of human labor. So it just did not scale very well as the number of companies, engagements, and hackers on the platform grew. So it became really important for us to rework the existing process and explore new and better ways to connect our organizations with hackers and also facilitate a hacker's involvement within these engagements. We did identify several key areas that we could improve, and these encompass the human effort involved, which was like the manual matchmaking process I just spoke about, as well as some lack of integrations within our existing architecture. So we knew that any improvement would need to address these areas specifically. And this is just an example of what our previous architecture looked like. Um, most of our functionalities did live within the monolith and they were confined to pretty narrow definitions. So within our monolith, we were overloading our command pattern to handle time-based workflows. For example, we have a system that stores a deadline and then it runs a cron job to make sure that no deadlines have passed. It runs and it checks, it runs and checks, it runs and checks, so on and so forth. But after a while, this process did not really pass the smell test. And we had a feeling that maybe we were approaching this the wrong way. And here is a very simplified diagram of what our newly proposed interactions looked like. We built a set of microservices and we needed to rely on different communication layers. So because of that, it became obvious that we needed to leverage some kind of mechanism that was capable of uninterrupted connections. Obviously, this new endeavor was really different from our Rails monolith, and it meant that we needed to adapt to changing processes. Um, there was a platform architecture pillar item that was to understand the business process workflows. And from that item, we were tasked with researching any suitable solutions. We shifted our understanding of these static processes into something more dynamic, and it led us to workflows, which are a more fluid paradigm that could accommodate time and event-based components and process data. So, if most of the new processes were their own workflows, what would be the best way to build and deploy them? And that's where Temporal comes in for us. So you might wonder, why did we choose Temporal specifically? Well, after our evaluation phase, it became obvious that Temporal offered the optimal solution for our specific requirements. We needed something that offered dependability and Temporal provides that through automatic retries, custom error handling, and the support for various types of workflows. But that wasn't the only deciding factor for us. We needed to move fast. And we were such a small team working on a new product, so that was kind of a difficult task. 
But because Temporal resembles standard code and offers support for Kotlin, we were able to get up to speed really quickly. And along with Temporal's abstraction of complex logic and visibility into these workflows, we were able to easily integrate the workflows into our distributed system. So in short, Temporal's adaptability, resilience, and learning curve played a huge role in reshaping our workflow orchestration strategy. And now, how did we tackle this refactor? Well, our initial problem was just wrapping our heads around the nature and nuance of Temporal itself. So at first glance and with very little understanding of what a workflow was, it seemed kind of complex and intricate. But as we became more familiar with general concepts like activity methods, sleep states, and the general structure, we were able to start designing our new system using these components. And so after we gained a better understanding of Temporal and how to properly utilize it, it was time to begin the process of translating our requirements into Temporal components. Uh, we began to identify what parts of our new services and features would be workflows, activities, or signals. And so for example, we knew that we needed to have an invitation flow. And this was something that was gonna manage the state of a specific invitation to a hacker for an engagement. So that became its own workflow. And since a workflow is made up of activities and signals, we then created an invitation activity. And that was responsible for updating the record based on the resolution status of an invitation. And then finally, we utilized a signal to signify the said resolution status to our other workflows. And here is where the fun really began. Um, crafting the initial workflow was easy and fun, and I felt like it just was over too soon. What, what I didn't understand initially was that there was an inherent simplicity and user-friendliness and accessibility to building these workflows. Any complexity that you found within the code actually came from an individual's need rather than being a consequence of using Temporal. So once the nuances between a workflow, activity, and signal became clear, it was easy to grasp and harness Temporal's modular structure. And so what exactly was our approach for building that first workflow? Well, we started the process by designing the interface and outlining our methods. And an interface, for anyone who might not be aware, is how you define the contracts for a class. So specific implementation details do not belong here. This is just the method names, parameters, and return types. And this provides clarity and structure to your workflows and activities. Then we wrote a few different activities. So some were responsible for querying a database and others acted as intermediaries um, facilitating a communication between multiple services. An activity can be pretty much, an activity method can be pretty much any type of functionality or interaction that you require. We just made sure that we were, that we were grouping together relevant activity methods within their own activity classes. So any activity method that was concerned with the machine learning model would exist within the machine learning activity and any activity related to hacker invitations would belong to the invitation activity class. And then finally, we constructed signals and they served as our final layer in this existing process. These signals assumed responsibility for communication across workflows and at times, even the termination of certain workflows. We have signals that span across entirely different services and trigger the update of certain records. And then once all the components were in place, we integrated them into that initial workflow. So beyond any slight oddity of tracking a workflow ID or managing sleep states, these machines of continuous motion were as simple or complex 
as we made them. And we were able to implement pretty complex workflows by utilizing abstraction and compartmentalization. And so we get to testing. And this is where I think the real complexity comes in. And it's just like what they say, writing code is 20% of the work and testing it is the other 80%. So you might think it's counterintuitive to mock and test the activities within a workflow instead of testing the outcome of the workflow itself. But it makes sense when you understand that there's a separation of concerns and responsibilities. A workflow is really just made up of different modular functions, mostly activities and signals. And when testing a workflow, you need to look to assess that those activities and signals were invoked within the workflow and then executed properly. It's easy to think of a workflow as something with its own response to mock and evaluate, but you need to respect its individual components and write unit tests that address their behavior within the greater workflow. So within this specific test, you might notice that there's no assertion for the signal that's sent. And that's because for this example, that signal didn't have a side effect. But if your signal updated a database, for example, then you could verify that here as well. And so I just talked about unit testing, but that isn't the only way to assure that something works properly. And it can sometimes leave major issues unexposed. End-to-end -end testing is needed to assess how everything works in a real-life scenario. We started our process by spinning up a temporal server locally, hard coding some dummy data, and then running our workflows as Gradle tasks. This was helpful and quick, and it allowed us to explore the temporal CLI and have a little bit of a better understanding of exactly how all this data is passed through the workflow engine. We could see the final results of the workflow within the temporal dashboard, and that's a tool that has a wealth of information about individual workflows, including input data and retry stats. So after, do, so after running this locally, we moved to our staging environment. And this is where we were able to experience more automation as we could utilize the scheduling feature. And we were also able to leverage more seed data and gauge the performance in a controlled setting. This was definitely an invaluable opportunity for us to identify what small details we may have overlooked and to gain some more exposure to the temporal dashboards functionalities. Had we not been able to incorporate seed data and run these workflows in a development environment, then we wouldn't have been able to confidently integrate them into our production code. This stage exposed some actual failures, and we were able to make decisions on how to handle them after experiencing them for the first time. Some of the mistakes that we made were simple, like relying on the wrong workflow ID when starting a sub workflow. And we also noticed that even though Temporal gives a lot of information in the form of timestamps and IDs and metadata, we still needed to implement custom logging to create a more intuitive developer experience. These were fairly easy fixes, and we did see an immediate improvement within the cloud dashboard. So after testing and demoing, we were finally confident enough to publish a live engagement within our production environment. And then the amount of data that we had grew from a small handful of, of engagements to hundreds of customized engagements. This then prompted another round of assessment where we were able to tweak our approach accordingly. And our approach to lifecycle management and execution within Temporal is rooted in the flexibility and adaptability that the workflow engine offers. Our workflows are designed to accommodate various engagement scenarios, including both short-lived and long-running processes. We've categorized our workflows into different types based on their responsibilities, like orchestrating engagements, gathering hackers, and managing invitations. So to manage this invitation, so to manage this engagement lifecycle, we've implemented a hierarchical structure. 
Our top level of workflow is responsible for just orchestrating all the needed setup and data for the rest of the workflows. And we'll call this one the orchestrator workflow. This runs on a schedule and communicates with many other services through different activities, but it has no sub workflows. So you'll see two very different activities within this workflow. One is responsible for querying a database and gathering specific information. That information is then passed to the machine learning model by way of the machine learning activity. This is specifically one area where we were able to remove the human siloing in our original process. So instead of a list of requirements being given to a machine learning engineer, and then they return a suitable list of hackers, which then need to be invited, a workflow handles the data processing and management. And here we have two workflows that are strongly connected. They're called the hacker and the invitation workflow. The hacker workflow starts the invitation workflow as a child workflow. And the invitation workflow then relies on a sleep timer to wait for user input and communicates with the hacker workflow, hacker workflow through a series of signals. These relay the status of an invitation and update the hacker's database. This hierarchical approach allows us to modularize the different steps of our process and enables efficient lifecycle management of complex engagements. And so as I wrap this up, I just wanted to share some of the notable metrics that we've experienced since implementing and deploying our new workflows. The launching of new engagements and creation of new crowds is three times as fast and will only continue to become more efficient as we fine tune our new processes. So this is largely due to the automation of the interaction with the machine learning model algorithm and our scheduled deployments. Then by replacing our labor intensive initial processes, we've managed to save on average of 15 human hours per week. So previously some deployments of invitations could take an engineer four to five hours per day per deployment to complete if the monolithic infrastructure was being throttled. And at present, we've experienced a 50% reduction in downtime. While our deployment of Temporal is still relatively new, we've observed a significant improvement in availability thanks to automatic retries and our customized error handling. So now, instead of a task just failing and the whole system being put on hold, we can either continue with a retry or utilize a fallback we implemented. And so far, this has been really successful in keeping everything moving. And finally, we've increased our engagement handling capacity by four times already. Due to temporal scaling capabilities, we will be able to handle thousands of simultaneous engagements and engagement launches and crowd deployments in the upcoming year. So by increasing the number of engagements we host, we're also able to onboard more hackers onto our platform, which brings more quality findings to customers. So overall, using Temporal has been beneficial to customers, hackers, and the company alike. And it was never too much for a small team to handle. I think we all really enjoyed learning and implementing this technology, and we're excited to see where the teams at BugCrowd go with it as well. And so that's everything for me. Amazing, Han. Thank you so much for sharing that journey with us. Um, I mean, with results like this, you must be getting bombarded with other teams at Bug Crowd wanting to learn more about um, how you how you can help them, you know, reduce that downtime. Yeah, we've definitely have hosted a couple meetings already where we're trying to to you know set them up for success and knowledge transfer, and they're they're yeah. getting underway. Excellent. That's awesome to hear. Um, okay, we have so many questions coming in through the Q&A, so um, we'll go ahead and get, get started with those. Thank you, everyone who's added questions so far. If you haven't, we have a few more minutes, so feel free to keep adding them in the Q&A below. Um, so we'll start with Zach. Um, he says, how do you handle your retry policies? Do you use the same retry policy for all of your workflows? Um, or do you have different retry policies based on the use case? And do you have any examples of this? 
Yeah, so we have different retry policies based on like individual workflows and what the kind of failure may entail. Um, so there are some workflows that if they fail because they are kind of orchestrating the larger thing, then that's a kind of full stop. We need to get our hands in here and see what exactly the problem was, um, whether it's an incorrect, you know, engagement ID was passed or there's some invalid data in there that requires us to actually go and look and make sure that everything is okay. But one of the, um, one of the kind of easier retry policies that we've implemented is with the invitations. So invitations go out in a batch. And previously, if one invitation failed, uh, perhaps the, uh, the invitation ID was wrong or the hacker's ID was wrong, then every invitation past that one invitation would also fail. The, the whole system would just stop. But now the invitations are sent out on an individual basis and we are utilizing um, asynchronous functions and patterns. Uh, so if hacker A has the wrong ID, then that won't affect hacker B through Z. And the process will just continue working as it should for everyone else while that one hacker will get a notification saying like, hey, this one failed and we can investigate that further. But now people don't, other invitations don't suffer as a consequence of that. Nice, nice. That totally makes sense. Um, and for those of uh, us on the call who maybe aren't familiar with the temporal retry policies, it's all under our docs under the key concepts, you can see um, all the different settings you can use uh, for workflows or activities to set retry policies, things like uh, the interval or the back off coefficient. Um, you can get pretty fine tuned there. Um, let's see, who, who should we go to next? Um, we can talk, uh, take one from uh, Jan. Uh, what versioning strategy did you use um, for versioning long running workflows and why? So because we're still kind of in our initial launch phases, we haven't actually gotten to utilize any versioning strategies yet. Um, so I can't really speak to that, but that's something that we are currently investigating and, and talking about what we want to do in the future. We just haven't gotten the chance to actually implement it and see one way or another like through yet. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and we'll take one more from Jan. Let's see. Um, did you need to automate some manual parts of your workflow, like some ops operations? And if so, how did you approach progressive automation? Yeah, so we did need to automate certain things. There was a lot of person A has um, a CSV and gives it to person B and person B does something with the CSV and gives it to person C and person C does something with the CSV. And so that was a huge um, driving component of what we wanted to fix and what we wanted to you know, optimize within this new uh, workflow and new process in general. So we were actually able to remove almost all of the, the human touch interactions within this process. Um, there's still you know, opportunities for fine tuning and there's still um, the opportunities to check and make sure that things are going as they should uh, and looking at metrics on how well invitations have been actioned upon. But for the most part, I mean, we've seen an amazing improvement just in using like the machine learning algorithm versus making these by hand matches. And so yeah. since we were getting such an amazing improvement by using the machine learning algorithm, we needed to build a system that was appropriate for that as well. And, you know, uh, was up to speed with how fast we were moving in other directions. Yeah. Yeah. You're a description of passing CSVs around is giving me flashbacks to like working in business intelligence, yeah. Um, removing, um, you know, those points of uh, possible failure is so important. Um, okay, we have another one from Brad. Uh, what's the advantage of communicating the invite status through signals as opposed to just returning a successful response for that child workflow? Are there other actions that the hacker workflow or invite workflow run while waiting for this signal? Um, so the invitation workflow 
it is just sending out the workflows and then it's just sleeping and waiting for it to be actioned. But right. the hacker workflow does have a little bit of extra stuff going on within it. Um, and so based on the resolution status of the signal, and it can be more than just succeeded or failed. Um, and so that's part of the reason why we're using signals because we do need a little bit more um, information than just yes or no. Uh, and the that hacker workflow will kind of action differently depending on how many of those invitations were accepted, rejected, ignored, what have you. And mm -hmm. then we use that, um, we, we keep a count of how many invitations were actioned in one way or another. And then the hacker workflow then goes on to do something with that information. So for us, the signals just ended up being a convenient and easy way for us to communicate um, kind of final resolution statuses. Nice, nice. Um, okay, I think we have a few questions here on how long it took to incorporate temporal into your system. So we have one person, um, Ladon, asking from planning to actual launch to going into prod. Um, and it, someone else is asking how long it took from start to finish to get going. Yeah, so I would say from planning, from the initial, okay, we, you know, want to use temporal, let's figure out temporal, let's try to play with it. That actually was probably the longest part of the entire process. Um, and part of that was just, uh, we maybe weren't approaching the initial uh, getting Temporal spun up locally correctly. We weren't using uh, Temporal's cloud features, but once we got um, integrated into Temporal cloud, we were able to like start Temporal server and see things moving. So the initial planning phases and everything, I would say were about maybe six months or so. But then once we started actually writing the code, we had things in our staging environment within a few months, um, probably like three months. It, it was a very, very quick process. Once we actually were able to start writing code and playing with it and seeing it in the temporal cloud dashboard and all that kind of stuff. So nice. definitely, I think it was one of those things where more planning paid off, um, but the planning was the longest part for us. And again, like just yeah. three engineers and we were able to build it pretty quickly. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, I love that you said you were really capable or able to turn your requirements into components pretty easily and that, you know, the temporal components kind of mapped to your business workflow logic. That was really cool. Okay, we, we have so many more. Are you good to keep going, hon? Yeah, I'm good. Excellent. Okay, so... Um, Oh, okay. Vlad ha has asked us, um, you know, thank you so much for the presentation, Han. How is a human operator interacting with the system? Is there a signal to wait on human feedback or is there another mechanism used? Yeah. So because there's like different components within, within the system, some things don't really have any human interaction. Like we do have um, scheduled deployments, so that doesn't need human interaction. Um, but we do have the capability for sending out invites. A mm -hmm. human could make a list of hackers to invite. And then they, we have a UI for this. Um, we built a whole new UI as well to accommodate and to kind of showcase all this work. Mm -hmm. So they have the ability to go into our new, um, to our new section of the site, uh, create a list of hackers that they want to invite. And then they hit a deploy button or an invite button, and then that deploys the hacker and invitation workflows. So we've kind of utilized, um, uh, you know, user interactions through UI uh, and an actual website to have the human interaction component. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, this one's related to that. Um, Christopher asks, do you have a case where you have a set of conditional steps where that human in the loop can reject a given step back to an earlier workflow step? And if so, how are you handling that scenario? Yeah, so actually we're currently building the functionality where if a hacker has been invited, um, someone has the ability to revoke that invitation and to also right. remove them from the workflow. 
And so currently what we're working on is the logic of how to actually, you know, handle this within our workflows and everything. But as it is right now, it ha I don't think that we're having to um, write a new workflow or anything for it. It's mostly just making sure that the database is updating correctly and that we're not interfering with anything that's currently running. Nice. I think that that one also answers another one here that Vlad asked. Um, okay, Zach, this might be for general temporal or it could be for Han. Let's see. Um, do you have type safety across different tech stacks? I think is your team just using Kotlin, Han? Yeah, we're just using Kotlin, so we okay. are we're typed. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, okay, and we I think we'll take one more, which is um, what is one of the more complicated flows that you had to tackle? Um, I would say that the initially dealing with the invitations, not the invitation flow, but the hacker flow where we were starting all these invitations, it was the first example of us using a child workflow. It was asynchronous. And we also had to do a bit of like pruning and logic before we even got to the invitation section, just to make sure that every hacker that we were about to send an invitation to was eligible, eligible to receive an invitation. Um, so after, now, like looking back, it really like isn't that complex. But for us, just because it was the first one that we tackled, that was definitely just the most difficult to wrap our heads around. Um, I think a lot of it was the asynchronous nature of it and trying to write code that assessed the status of an invitation without knowing when or where an invitation was going to be, you know, mm. um, actioned upon. But we also are currently working on a new workflow that is kind of dealing with a lot of different things outside of hackers and outside of invitations. And so that's going to be complex. And that's uh, what we're currently working on now. And it's a bit of dealing with what is the separation of concerns? Um, you know, where do all of these individual components actually fit? Do they even belong in this workflow? Those are kind of the higher level conversations that we're having right now. And we haven't um, come to a final consensus because there's always, you know, an argument for one way and the other. Yeah, definitely. I know how that goes. Uh, it sounds like you are just having amazing impact um, at Bug Crowd, Han. And thank you so much for uh, answering all of those questions. And thank you everyone who has joined today. Like I mentioned, you will get, uh, you'll be able to access a recording of this session. Uh, we cannot thank Han Mace enough for joining us and taking all of the time today um, to share the Bug Crowd journey. Um, one last reminder is that, uh, you know, again, replay is coming up. Um, Han, I can't wait to hear all of your feedback about Kotlin and the CLI and everything that you're working with in person. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing you there. Yeah, me too. It's going to be so fun. Definitely. Definitely. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone so much for taking the time today. We appreciate you um, and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you, Han. Thank you, thank you so much.